And I've started. Okay. So we're going to uh, start with a uh, quick review of some of the aspects of New Testament gatherings that we've uh, been learning and, and reading about and viewing and experiencing. Uh, just uh, a couple of the aspects that have, uh, that have been highlighted already. Uh, the first one is the, the concept of gatherings being participatory um, as, as much as possible. I think there's a real value in Scripture around that. Uh, one of the uh, quotes that a couple of you have mentioned on the forums is Viola's quote where he says, The Lord Jesus cannot fully disclose himself through only one member. He's far too rich. And there just is, and you know, we're all very, very much aware of the importance of every every person's gifts mattering in the body of Christ. It's interesting when you really look for New Testament teaching on the gathering itself. Uh, you can't find a, a larger section uh, on that whole thing. Uh, you can't find any place that deals with it more fully than First Corinthians twelve, thirteen, and fourteen. And uh, it's interesting that those are the verses. I mean, we're familiar with those chapters very well, and we're familiar with the verses that talk about the body of Christ, depends on each, uh, each part of the body. And then 1 Corinthians 13, talking about love. Uh, and 1 Corinthians 14, uh, in particular, we uh, often uh, focus on 1 Corinthians 14, 26. It says when you come together, everybody uh, has something to participate. But that whole section together is, is, is quite a dissertation on the body of Christ functioning together, and it's very much focused on, on the gathering. And so participatory is one of the things that we've been talking about. Um, and I know even in the forums we've talked about how do we get, how do we move toward participatory, and I, I am sure we'll have a chance to talk more about that tonight as well. Uh, I know that the expectation that we have as, as even as Christians when we come together has something to do with uh, everybody understanding what it means to be participatory. Uh, ownership matters. Uh, does the group coming together really have an ownership of the group as the church, or are they just seeing it something that they kind of participate in that others uh, are responsible for, and so they don't have as much responsibility? And I think identity matters in terms of uh, the church seeing themselves, each member, as a valuable member of the church. And uh, identity matters in terms of the church seeing that a small group a small church, a house church, or whatever you choose to call it, really is uh, the church in, in the very real sense. It's not a second-class church. It's the reality of, of what church is. And I have found that, that uh, those things matter, expectation, ownership, and identity. I say that because I, I've been in a number of settings where I have been involved in small groups, uh, as, as you guys have over the years, involved with different, many different kinds of small groups. Uh, and then, but then I've also had the experience of seeing some people that I have been in small groups with before uh, encounter, uh, then I, I've seen a uh, situation where I've been with them where they've gone through a change of their mindset in terms of what church is for whatever reason, and now they're in a group that they are seeing as their church. Now, however you accomplish that, uh, you know, some different ways to look at that. But my point is, is that they've made, I've seen people make a, a, um, a perspective shift where they are seeing themselves as part of a group and seeing themselves as part of the church and seeing themselves as that is, uh, this group is my church and it's a small participatory uh, thing. And what I'm saying is that I've seen people move into that kind of environment and change. I really have seen that a number of times where they suddenly do begin to show up. They suddenly do begin to take part in a way I've never seen them do before, and they do begin to contribute. So that really can happen. So we're talking about participatory. Just want to greet to whoever joined us. I think it's Ricardo. Can you hear us okay, Ricardo? Yeah. Great. Good to have you with us. Uh, so we're talking about some of the aspects of the New Testament gatherings that we've been talking about. We've talked about the, the gatherings being an extended family. Great concept uh, and, and a lot of good sharing around that. Braden, by the way, uh, uh, appreciated your article on hospitality. Um, the, the church being a place where a family uh, enjoys family life together and then through hospitality extends it to others. Uh, somebody says that uh, for us, we don't invite people to church, but we invite people into our family. And I think that's a lot about what, uh, what the church is meant to be. And uh, one, of the, one of the joys, I think, of uh, simpler, smaller expressions of church, and we all experience that in different ways, but certainly there is that joy of, of real community taking place and family-like communities 
uh, uh, being able to experience really sharing life together. I was talking on the phone yesterday with an old friend. Uh, we go way back, going, went to school together 30, 30 years ago. And uh, he's, he's been in traditional church settings, uh, but for whatever reason, and he's a very nice guy, but he was lamenting uh, that he really didn't have close friends uh, 35 years of being involved. Uh, now, I know there's lots of reasons for that, but the point is, is it's, it's wonderful when our communities really can provide that, that family, uh, uh, true family aspect of, of uh, I believe, what church is, is uh, often really meant to be. Uh, we've talked about spirit-led gatherings, prevenience, the concept, and some of you read John White's article where he uses that term, the idea being that God is always at work before we come on the scene, which is a great thought. Uh, he doesn't wait for us to show up. He's already working. He's already at work in people's lives. Uh, he actually has an agenda, and it's much more exciting to come together to uncover what God's at doing, what God is doing, uh, than to come together and set the agenda for God to bless. And many of you have mentioned Felicity's uh, quote, which I'll quote again. She says, "The Holy Spirit." I'm sorry, I'm quoting Felicity Dale. She says, the Holy Spirit has the plan for what needs to be accomplished, and if we will learn to hear and follow his promptings, we will never have a boring meeting. And it may be that one of the main purposes of gathering is for the saints to learn to gather, to hear and follow the Spirit. And I really agree with that latter part. It, I really believe that that's part of what it is to get together, to learn together, to hear and follow the Spirit. Now, I don't want to set up an unrealistic expectation that... Our gatherings should never be boring. I find that gatherings are sometimes boring and sometimes very exciting and very meaningful. And I personally think that flow from one to the other is always going to be there. And uh, when you go to a boring meeting, you go away and say, hmm, you know, what was that about? And what do I want to do differently? And gives the church, uh, at which is all of the members, a chance to sort of say, uh, you know, what, what do we want to do about this so that uh, we have more life when we are together. Uh, so spirit-led provenience, some good concepts there. Uh, we've talked about the New Testament gathering being word-centered, and I do do really see that simple churches often become even more word-centered because that's the authority we find ourselves looking to as opposed to a specific person or a sp specific delegated person to be the authority. Um, I, I just, for me personally, and I've got articles about this this heresy concern, I I personally, that, that it just throws me because heresy is almost always, you know, the concern being that, that a, a church without all of the hierarchical leadership is going to fall into heresy. Heresy is almost always introduced uh, historically by authoritarian leadership in priest-led movements, in movements that are very, very strongly priest-led. That's, that's most of the time we, where you see uh, in, uh, examples of heresy that has really rocked the church. It's come from that kind of leadership. On the other hand, where you see movements that are taking place based primarily on this uh, 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 commitment to the authority of Scripture as the, the guiding light, uh, rarely do those movements find themselves moving into uh, away from the truth of the Word of God. But in any case, word-centered becomes a real focus and allows the churches to remain focused on God's Word as opposed to anything else. And finally, number five, incarnational. Uh, we have the opportunity to season the world with the wonder of Jesus' love and kingdom everywhere that we go. And uh, the gathering's uh, not the end all, of course. It's just part of what we are doing in our life as Jesus' followers. And this does remind us, this last point, that, that uh, gatherings really are meant to support the Jesus-following lifestyle. And uh, I may touch on this just a little bit later, but I, and I think I've emphasized it in the, in the video already. Uh, but uh, I almost, even in this course, I almost feel like I do a little bit of a disservice by jumping into gatherings as our number two session because it almost sort of um, fosters the mindset of, of how we do gatherings is so important. And that is our traditional institutional mindset of, of how church life is done. We tend to focus on how is the gathering done? How does the gathering take place? And in doing that, I, I do think we really miss the... the uh, the, the large point of, of I think, a point in, uh, important paradigm shift, which is that we are we are not called to start gatherings, run gatherings, and I, I you know I think I've emphasized this before. There's so little in the scripture about you know the right way to do a gathering, the right way to do a prayer meeting, the right way to lead these kind of things. 
because really the focus is on the, the life that we live with Jesus, the lifestyle we live with Jesus. We're called to go and make disciples, not go and make gatherings. And when we live that life out, uh, living fully for Jesus, making disciples, uh, living a going lifestyle, gatherings uh, become a byproduct, a, a good byproduct, an important byproduct, a, a necessary byproduct. Uh, but they really can come in and support this lifestyle in us and support uh, the going and making of disciples. And in that sense, I, I believe when we really get that in the right perspective, uh, then gatherings are going to vary quite a bit from one context to another. And I believe they should vary a great deal from one context to another. I also believe uh, gatherings can and should be quite fluid. In other words, there's not one size fits all. There, there may be one way to do it for a season. And as we are following Jesus together, the way that gathering meets can change quite a bit. And I think, uh, uh, I think in, in following Jesus, what we'll find that gatherings can, can shift and morph and change and can remain quite fluid. So we're putting a highlight on the gathering, but I just wanted to, to mention that uh, in, in many ways that thinking, our thinking is that you know, if we get the gathering right, we've got the church right. And I think that actually can get in the way of getting the lifestyle right, the following Jesus part right, and then allowing the gathering to support and uh, uh, be part of the expression of the life of Jesus um, around us. So just wanting to get a couple of those things out. So that's our kind of intro. I want to jump into uh, turning this over to uh, sharing from you guys. And so what we'll do is, let's see if I get my PowerPoint here working right. Here we go. I'm going to ask each of you, I've asked, asked you guys to reflect on a couple of questions. I said, what are you excited about that's taking place in your gatherings uh, right now? Um, and if you have some real life examples of that, we'd love to hear them. And or... Uh, what have you learned recently through this course that you're excited about implementing in your gatherings? And maybe take a moment and explain how that might look, how you might take uh, something that you've learned and work it into a, a gathering that you're currently involved in. So kind of wide open here a little bit. Uh, we'll try to keep it to uh, three or four minutes each so everybody has a chance to, to get around. And I'll make notes here. And uh, we're going to follow the order up on the screen. So. Josh, uh, now I'm getting a little bit of an echo, so again, if everybody could mute uh, themselves when you're not sharing, and then unmute when you are, that's going to help us uh, with the quality. Good. I think we solved that one. So Josh, uh, do you want to jump in first and do a little sharing with us? That'd be great. Sure. How's my audio? Sounding good. We're good. Okay, great. Um, yeah, well... First off, hey everybody, uh, it's good to be with you. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited about uh, that's, that's taking place in our gatherings right now is um, is our deconstruction process. And one of the things I was really uh, reminded by as we as we started uh, going through, and, and even even in our uh, it, um, our Skype sessions, we were we were just reiterating how people were were. And, and Roger, you said it just a little bit ago that we're not a second class uh, or second citizen type church, but that we are, uh, in fact, um, a, a vibrant group of, of believers um, that that love and cherish uh, our friendships and and even shifting into into family. And uh, so that that's really cool, and and that that actually leads into the second part. Um, that uh, that's what I'm really excited to, to continue to implement, that, that the family structure that is a very powerful, uh, not just a tool, but, but a powerful way to influence and, and make disciples. And, um, and it's been my experience uh, in, in our gatherings that as, as we've drawn close to one another and, and learn how to, to love one another and eat food together and and talk about what what God is saying to us, and and, and what He's calling us to obey, and, and and laying our hands on one another, and praying for one another, that we begin to experience uh, community and family in a, in a way that we haven't before. And and when we do, when we enter into that place, and as we've entered into that place, uh, it's a very very exciting 
um, and and it does it, it, it has a way of, of killing um, uh, any of that that boringness and 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 brings um, just an intention and an intentionality a uh, uh, a love for one another. Um, so it, it is a very, it's been a very cool process, and, and uh, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm very excited to continue to reinforce and, and continue implementing in the in the house churches that we're that we're doing. Yeah, that's great, Josh. Yeah, Dan, do you have some uh, specific uh, experiences with the this community life you're describing, either? Um, either bringing people into that community life that are newer disciples or brand new, or seeing that community life influence others out in the world? Do you have any specific examples of seeing that take place? Uh, specifically, we've got, <clears throat> we've got a couple that, that was, was the object. We call them the object of our affection for a little while. Hmm. And, and really what we were doing was um, they, they couldn't come. and We invited them to, to come and and tried to call them and pursue them, and um, just knowing that they, they lived in a town that was difficult for them to come to church on Sundays uh, with their work schedule. So, so uh, knowing them from a traditional church, that's how that's how we were acquainted originally. We we began to um, to to go, you know, 30 miles away to meet them at their place uh, and to love them. And it was really cool because the ladies uh, in our in our house church, two of them. They uh, they helped them plan their wedding, which was a really really cool uh, ministry to to uh, uh, to this this gal uh, of this family that we're pursuing, and, and it was just uh, an awesome uh, way that they that they felt really loved and um, and and pursued. So that 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 was one tangible specific way. Yeah, that's great. Kind of sounds like the the family adopting somebody, and it's hard for it's hard for people to not be compelled by that when they've been adopted by an entire family. And yeah. uh, you know, just reflecting on Jesus, Jesus said that the the quality of our life together, our unity, would actually have an impact uh, on unbelievers. So I, I think that's that's a great challenge, of course, for uh, the entire church uh, as a body, and and certainly, you know, we have that opportunity with simple churches to to really uh, practice that in a very practical way. It's awesome. Uh, we actually had an experience with a, a non-believer uh, that was drawn to come into a existing group of people uh, for that very reason. They, she had built friendships with a number of them, and uh, you know, a lot of times we do focus on the incarnational, going outward and, and reaching people where they're at. But this particular gal was very drawn to the community, and she came. I would say for over a year before uh, she accepted Christ fully into her life, uh, but, the, but was just compelled by this uh, community life and became very much a part of it before, uh, uh, before she uh, became a Christian herself. I think that's the old St. Patrick model, if anybody's familiar. Anyway, great, Josh. Thanks so much for sharing with us. I appreciate it. Uh, Pamela's up next, and she actually emailed me some of her thoughts because she couldn't be here and, and uh, very re much regretted it. So I'm going to share a little bit about what Pamela had to say. Um, the question, the first one was, what are you excited about that's taking place in your gatherings right now? She said, I, I can see God trying to move us to the Simple Church direction in various ways, and this has me excited. Whether or not the whole group will respond is yet to be seen. Some of the ways he's moving us are he's, he brought a pastor and a wife couple who have spent the last 10 years trying to teach us not to look to them for our spiritual feeding. And then part of that mental transition has led to more discussion format services. And the shift to stop relying on the ministers caused some talented but overly controlling members to stop worshiping with us. And then with some members leaving, our financial picture is such that in a short while we'll no longer be able to support our minister or keep renting our current location. Uh, then fifth, she says, our membership, though, is, is fairly spread out geographically, so a group of people are already trying out the house church concept on some Sundays, although right now that's kind of a mini version of our traditional service. And then she says there's a lot of tension among the, the parents over whether or not to continue having children's church. Um, let's see. So a group of people, yeah, so they're trying to, somewhere else here, I'm sorry, I'm looking through her notes real quickly here. Um, one of the things that uh, they're hoping for, 
Oh, I'm sorry. So what have you learned about implementing in your gatherings? What, what have you learned that you're excited about? She said spirit-led gatherings where everybody comes prepared to listen to the spirit. She's excited about that. She's excited about a word-centered uh, house church gatherings, uh, the idea of authentic community, the idea of being missional and incarnational. And she's support, uh, excited about reproducing. She says there's so many small adjacent towns where I live there isn't a very good reason for all of us to commute every week to one specific town where we could have churches in Carlisle, Mechanicsburg, Camp Hill, etc. So she's excited about that. So uh, that's just kind of interesting to, to read through that. Uh, they're, they're making their way through a transition that in terms of numbers has cost them at this point uh, as they have moved to something that's a little bit more participatory. And uh, I, I think we will talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. And yet out of that, um, and it could even change their whole financial picture here. It seems to be changing that as well. Um, and yet I see as she works her way through that it has given her a different uh, expanded vision to see the possibilities of um, smaller churches, house churches, perhaps simple churches in a variety of different locations and even towns. So interesting kind of uh, transition there that uh, she seems to be going through. So. Pamela, thanks for sharing. She'll be listening to the recording. And uh, that'll take us to Ricardo. Ricardo, would you like to jump in and share some of your thoughts here? Okay. Um, hello, everybody. And uh, thanks for putting me so early because I actually have to leave because my son is actually playing a football match to me. It's, it's actually at 30. Okay. He's not even aware that I'm not there. He just slipped out. But, but, but with me, um, in terms of gathering, it's a little bit different because uh, my gathering, as you know, one of the things that I've enjoyed about the course so far, and I've been doing a lot, a lot of reading <clears throat> um, on the course of the material, because I'm a reader, is discovering where I'm going on my journey with God, because that was one of my hardest things in leaving the church as a pastor for 10 years. <clears throat> and um, so my, our, my gatherings now are very small. With my wife, I actually meet with my wife. We meet in Jesus' name. And we meet for prayer. And we meet to minister to each other, to minister in terms of our connections and our relationships that we have, which we have a lot of. And also, I meet with my family. Um, and we gather in Jesus' name. And we, we were accustomed to meeting before as a family. And why I say it, it, it's not that, it's not exciting in the sense that it is normal for me, it is natural, because the people that I'm meeting with, that I meet with, it's not like when I was at the church, where I had so many friendships, but really didn't know the people well, or they didn't know me well. The people that I'm really related to now, and meeting with, are people that I'm enjoying life with. And I believe that that's what Christianity is about, is life together. So it is my wife, it is my family, we meet, and so on. And one of the things that I enjoy about them, is that I get an opportunity now, to teach them about the kingdom and a kingdom lifestyle rather than a church lifestyle. And they are enjoying that as well. Uh, in terms of how God has, what, what happened is God, God um, one of the things that I, I, I discovered from reading Wolfgang Simpson during this course is the, the apostolic migration that God has me on, bringing me out of the church, out of the church world, in vertical commas, so that he can take out of me because it's harder to get, it's easier to get the people of God out of Egypt than to get Egypt out of the people of God. So God has to bring me out and sort of like, you know, it's, it's, taken, it's, it's taken a while before a lot of the traditional things get out of me. But I enjoy meeting with my family and I believe that in, in eventually other people are going to become part of our family in the same way. Uh, because one of the things that I also learned in the course is that the, and I, I knew this from before, that the, the, the basic and most fundamental expression of the church is, is marriage and family. And I also meet in, in my workplace because I work. And, I believe, and, and, and one of the things that, I, that is, when I say well, exciting to, to, to meet, it's not that exciting to meet for me because it's part of me to meet, but it's also part of me to see everything that I do as ministry. My work is ministry. My, my, I'm, I'm working on, on, I'm writing books now is ministry. You know, I have a lot of relationships and connections. I, I, I believe in not only gathering, but I believe that God is, I'm a 
apostolic sending. God is sending me out. And I have connections, relationships. I have a guy in Alabama. You know, a, a white guy. He's probably my best friend. And hopefully we are going to go to uh, Antigua in November to start a school there for, for music, a music school. Last year we went to um, Caracu in Grenada. We went to Petit Martinique together, you know, starting a music school and so on. And the interesting thing here is that even in my workplace, I meet, we meet, uh, we, we look forward to our meeting because it's, it's unique, it's neat, it's, it's really awesome because we've been living life together for so long. And an interesting happened about, and I'm not even following my time, happened recently where people know that we meet and so on. And a, a girl from our factory died. She came to work one morning and the next morning, she, she was there. Um, when I came to work, everybody with people in the factory were falling down, they were fainting. I mean, nobody could, the boss of the company, he, he didn't know what to do. And the human resource manager, she, she wanted to bring in a counselor. And my boss, who was a non-Christian, a, a pagan, I mean, you know, he, he, he said no. And he asked me if I would um, assist. And uh, we, we, I, we took all this stuff, we have like 200 cents staff, and we bought all people in the canteen. And, you know, we, 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 we brought, I brought everybody together and um, we ended up praying for everybody and, you know, releasing the power of God and comfort of God and everything because one of the things that I, I know that, you know, that if God, is, God is, is not only gathering the church, God is scattering the church. God is scattering the church and God is more interested in scattering the church into the marketplace, into the, the places of the world where non-Christians are where Christians have to live the, a lifestyle of the kingdom, a kingdom lifestyle. And as you said, I was surprised about the gathering coming so early in the course because it does focus on whether that the gathering is so, such a critical thing. And it is important because God told us to love each other and to minister to one another. But interestingly, Jesus never focused on gathering. He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. But he says, as, as, um, as, the Father has sent me, so send that you. So one of the things we have to do in the gathering and outside of the gathering is to listen to the voice of the Spirit so that He can send us out into the world or wherever He wants to, us to be so that we can be instruments that He can use for His glory and His honor and His praise. And I, I'm enjoying the course because it's not only the, the interaction on the forums, I, I enjoyed our, our triad and so on tremendously, but it's from the learning. That's what I'm doing. I, I, I'm not. A, I, I watch videos. But I'm doing a lot of work, work reading. All the paradigms, all the all the house church things. I, I mean, I, I I have I have two folders full of material that I've been reading because I I'm, I'm interested in learning fast because I know that God is preparing me for great things. Mm. Wow. Fantastic, Ricardo. Great sharing. Wonderful sharing. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other thing that that thing, my boss. My, I, when I was in the church for 10 years as a pastor, I tried to get into the prison. And I couldn't get into the prison, to minister to the prison. And two weeks ago, my boss's wife came and asked me, she know I'm a Christian, she, she know that I serve God. And she came and asked me if I would go, she's the librarian of the prison, I didn't even know. She came and asked me if I would go into the prison, to minister to the prisoners. And I said yes, and on Thursday, I'm going into the prison to minister to 40 prisoners. She called me this morning and told me, that there's going to be 40 prisoners that I have to minister to uh, on Thursday morning. Fantastic. To, That's to fantastic. my work life. Because my work is part of my worship to God. Yes, absolutely. And the sick, sick, the secular division is, is destroyed. Yeah. Yes. Well, you brought up some wonderful points, and I, I really do appreciate it. Um, really good stuff. Uh, you started with the, the, the reality that church does begin with the family, and it really does, your wife first, and that really is, uh, I think, one of, the, one of the reasons Jesus even said uh, where two or three are gathered, because that is, that is the core of what church life is. Uh, my good friend uh, who's uh, in Kenya, actually, he, he really has seen a, a, a pretty, um, uh, pretty good church planning movement take place, and when he works with leaders in particular, especially church leaders who have been leading churches for some time, pastoring for some time, uh, he almost always uh, sends them home to learn how to do church in their family because they've become so uh, so oriented toward others and programs uh, to keep the church going that they've kind of lost sight of just this 
family life that really does begin at home. And so he sends them home to learn how to, to be the church with, uh, with family first. And then out of that, as that life develops, it's just very, very natural for them to begin to draw, uh, draw in neighbors and to embrace other people and, and bring them into this family spiritual life. And so I, I can really see the power uh, of what that's done in your life, uh, Ricardo, very, very clear. And then, and then you express so well how the church, uh, when we get out of the the church gathering being the focal point, what what happens is the church uh, can be the, the the church scattering, which uh, doesn't mean it doesn't gather, but we can we can gather uh, the gatherings can be contextualized to where we're reaching people. If it's the workplace, if it's the uh, park, or whatever wherever it is, the gathering can be contextualized there, and there's so much power in that. So, very powerful, very very helpful, Ricardo. I sure appreciate your sharing tonight. Okay. So we're gonna so move on. To Sorry? I listen to the bounce of the tape. Thanks. You bet. Yeah. So we're going to get everybody a chance to share. Jerry, uh, you're up next. You want to chime in here? Well, I don't really know what to say. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm not in a uh, house church right now. I want, I want to be. I'm not even in a small group right now. So... <laughs> I'm kind of at loose ends here on this. Uh, <laughs> well, now your picture, your pictures, you're pictured with your wife, Jerry. So I'm thinking there's a small group pretty close, pretty well, nearby. There is. there is, and we uh, we have. Uh, well, my grandson is coming down from college with his wife, and probably bring two or three others with him. So we'll have uh, we'll have some this weekend. Great. So maybe we can have a church there. Whenever we, I've been talking to them about house church, and uh, so whenever we gather around like the breakfast table or something, I say, "Well, this is my house church, so we'll uh, we'll do that." Sure. My, my grandson wants to be a missionary to Tokyo, Japan. So I've really been trying to indoctrinate him in uh, the house church idea that uh, hopefully he will use it over there when he goes over there to be a missionary in two or three years. So uh, I'm pretty excited about influencing him in that direction. Absolutely. You, you know, Jerry, before I forget, somebody just sent me a, a, a short manual written by a, a Japanese uh, church leader who is uh, working to um, – I uh, see some uh, house the house church concept understood over there, and so if, if you send me an email, I'll send that to you. It might be interesting okay. to your son. Yes, yes, I'd like to I'd like to see that. Uh, go ahead. I don't know exactly what I'm learning. I uh, I've been studying this for several months, uh, probably a year at least, and so I've read. A lot of books. I've looked at a lot of websites. I've seen a lot of videos, and I was hoping this class could kind of bring it all together for me. Um, I think I said in my profile or something I've been church planning for thirty some years in traditional type church planning, but now I want to uh, launch out into. I like to call it home church planning. We're talking about family here and the importance of family in the home. And that God established the home before he established the church uh, back in the Garden of Eden. And so I kind of like to call it home churching. Now, uh, you know, some people do homeschooling. Some people may have a home business. So I think uh, we ought to have home churches. And... Uh, I think the home implies uh, family. We had uh, our extended family uh, in for Thanksgiving last Thanksgiving. We had 47 people there, and um, that was a good feeling. We we had a a good uh, enjoyment time together, visiting and catching up on one another's uh, things and uh, eating and. Um, even in uh, established churches, traditional churches, in establishing a traditional church, I always try to have uh, some kind of uh, fellowship time of eating 
uh, probably every Sunday doing some coffee or something at least, and then we have uh, potluck meals. I found these times to be times of real bonding of the group, and I feel that that's very, very important. And so if it was done in a house church setting, home church setting, uh, it would be family, and uh, there would be uh, great bonding there and love for one another. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are some of my thoughts off the top of my head. I hope it isn't dandruff, but um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to experiencing this and getting uh, uh, started in this uh, facet of my ministry. That's great. That's awesome, Jerry. Great sharing. Got to establish the home before he established the church, and and really, it is so much about extended family. And uh, I, you know, I know in many cultures around the world, extended family is still very much a central part of, of social networks. Um, and and yet, uh, in, in every society, including ours, where the extended family is not always uh, so cohesive, there still are very significant social networks that we are a part of, and uh, being able to see those uh, uh, being used to. Uh, be a place where the spiritual life can uh, bring people together and bond people together, and you described that very, very well. Um, by the way, this course will not bring all of that together for you because it won't oh. come together for you until you're until you right. until you're out to doing it, and even then, it continues to come together. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is one of those things that we uh, we learn by doing and experiencing, and and so we're all still learning and experiencing, and therefore still uh, still learning. So, but uh, thanks for sharing that, Jerry. Great stuff. Appreciate it. So I'm going to move us along to uh, Sarah. It's your turn. I know you didn't have a chance to know you were coming, but there you are, and uh, you're up next. Would you like to jump in and share a little bit? Sure. Yeah, I am. Here by myself, Jeremy is still working, but so I'll try and share for both of us here. But um, I, gosh, the last couple weeks have been just such a transition time for us. I've just been uh, getting all things finished as far as me transitioning out of being the uh, kids ministry director at our local church here. Um, God's just changed our hearts and just really kind of we feel his insisting on us moving in this direction away from um, organized traditional church and into this um, whole simple organic church um, movement which gosh I'm realizing I think one of the things I'm really realizing about myself is how much I operate in fear <laughs> it's mm. not a fun thing to see in myself but um, as 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 anxiety comes up, even in meetings and having to formally explain what we're doing and why we're leaving, and uh, and just you know, it's sensing people looking at you like you're like what <laughs> is um I I just the spirit's been really pointing out a lot of I guess fear of man issues that I hadn't seen so much, and um, so that's a good thing though because <laughs> it's bringing me kind of freedom in that and sure um so. Just big times of change for us. We've, we've been connected with uh, Desi and Rose Starr down in Denver and got to share with them. We're really excited about getting to be a part of their life, just being down there. We came for dinner. It was so neat. Just even had we been there about 20 minutes and two guys walk in the front door that are part of their community and uh, we got to know them. They stayed for dinner and then another guy knocks on the door and um, he comes in and sits down and he goes, want to hear my story? And he shares his story about coming out of the gay lifestyle and just, it was just a beautiful thing because here we thought we were coming to hear about what they, how they live and we got to actually see it and just their home being so open and just the community that they're in, um, just being so accessible to people in their lives and um, we loved that. We're really inspired by them. Um, and so right now uh, we had for our gathering, you know, we've been just taking a step at a time as God's been guiding us. When we started gathering people, it began, we heard a model of just really gathering other Christians in your neighborhood and getting on mission with them to love each other and then love our neighbors. And that's sort of what got us into this whole um, thing. And so I don't know that they, all of them are committed to other 
traditional churches. And uh, we just right now are kind of going to push pause on that with everyone and just take about a month to really listen to the Lord and go and observe Rose and Desi's home group, which is about an hour away from our house. But um, we really want to soak up and really hear what God's leading us to do um, and then one by one kind of share with the rest of these people and see if they're if they want to be a part of that or not. Um, we don't want to necessarily try and pull them away from that. That has to be the spirit that draws them. So we're excited about that. I think um, our church, me leaving, we're a very small church, and I held up a huge portion of things as far as the organization went. And I know that's going to have some drastic effects. And it's hard to um, walk away, even though they're sending us in love. It's still I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that the Lord is doing something in that, um, even though it's hard to kind of see. Um, I'm not even sure really how to voice that. But So I've been learning. We've been practicing um, this CO2 model that um, John White, is that his name, mm -hmm. yeah. um, has laid out. So just my husband and I are really just church of two, this idea, yeah, that we are a church, just the two of us. And... Um, I'm a little bit, uh oh, sorry, my little one looks like she got hurt out here. And daddy's not home to help me. Hey, baby, you're okay. Um, so I'm, I'm excited, and I'm, I, the Matthew 14 the other morning was, just spoke to me. I felt like the Lord was saying it was the passage where Jesus just fed the 5,000, and he insisted that the disciples go across the lake, and that was where they were to, you know, encounter the storm. And um, that's kind of how I feel right now. I feel like, oh, Lord, I know you're insisting we go this way, and yet it's so unknown. I feel totally out of control, and, um, and yet just his words of comfort of, don't be afraid. You know, I'm with you. So that's where I'm at. We're excited about walking ahead. We know the Lord has that. He's prevenient, if that, makes, if that works there. But yeah, we know he's going ahead of us, and... Um, we're really excited. We're kind of ready to go oh, and let go of all the <laughs> traditional church duties we've been doing for so many years and step into this. <laughs> That's great. I really appreciate you sharing. Uh, I think you describe where you know a lot of people really are in yeah, that place of it's, it's an in-between place and uh, mm -hmm. and all. I I mean I would say I'm eight years later I sort of stepped into the unknown and I'm not suggesting I have stepped out of it. I think in part that's where God calls us to be. Uh, when we have all the answers, I'm not sure we always have His answers, and so it's uh, mm -hmm. it's a wonderful thing to be willing to sort of step out and explore. Uh, lots of new things, so I really appreciate the way you've, uh, the way you've shared that. Um, and your willingness to uh, hold loosely. That's the other thing I guess I, I'm hearing from you. You've kind of stepped out with one idea in mind, getting on mission with other Christians, and, and you're kind of putting that on hold. And I, I do think that's one of the great things about this, this journey is we, you know, we don't have to get it all figured out uh, right up front. I, I know for me, as I made this transition, it's one of the things that God said clearly to me. So, Roger, I'm not going to give you the blueprint hmm. um, because that's uh, that's kind of the way it's, it had worked for me before. It's kind of like he would lay out mm -hmm. the blueprint for how to build, and I would just say thank you, and I'd go build it. And he clearly <laughs> said it was going to be a step at a time, and that's certainly descriptive of what it really means to, to be a follower is that, uh, you know, when the cloud moves, then we move with it, and that's mm -hmm. the faith journey he calls us to. So I really really hear that with you. And uh, I, I wrote here, for those that don't know, Desi and Rose, they live in inner city Denver, and they're uh, working with this network of house churches in that area. Great people. Desi actually traveled with me to uh, Africa uh, last month. He wanted to, to experience some of the cross-cultural work that we're doing there, so it was great having him along. And uh, He's in Colorado. I'm in, I'm in California, so we he, he, mm -hmm. he really wanted to hook up and be part of that. So glad you're hooked oh. up with them, and, and uh, glad to have you sharing. Uh, Sarah, it's great. Thanks. And tell Jeremiah we missed him. Okay. Um, Stephen, you want to jump in here? So I got to fix my microphone now. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with question number two first, and then go back to number one. Um, one of the things that I'm most excited about is letting the Holy Spirit lead. Um, I think it's good to have a plan um, for the gathering, such as. 
uh, I like Felicity Dale's study the word, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayer. Um, but also be willing to let the Holy Spirit interrupt, stop, change the gatherings as he sees fit. Um, as for how it looks, I have no idea. He's, the Holy Spirit can be unpredictable. <laughs> um, but one thing that we are really good at is praying for one another. We uh, get scriptures to share with one another, uh, pictures sometimes. Uh, it's my desire that we would uh, be open to flow more in the gifts of the Spirit, with whether it's tongues, interpretation, prophecy, uh, whatever. We're, where, we, where we are at, there is very heavy spiritual warfare and so sometimes we need uh, discernment of spirits, we just need wisdom and uh, how to minister to one another, how to minister to those around us, how, how to take care of our kids. Health is uh, uh, one of the, those things that our kids get attacked with more than anything. When we first moved here, um, our boys had nightmares in which they never had before. Um, uh, and but because we've been able to share with others and lots of prayers gone out, they're able to sleep through the night now. Um, and I think that's one of the things that is exciting about bonding together. Is you can just sit and share where you're at right now. Um, whether it's you know we've got tons of finances we've got to meet this week or or this month. We've got our children are sick. We're traveling. It's our, the other family that we're meeting with. They're traveling this week and. Um, they said normally when they go to this place, the kids get sick, they're frustrated, they're, they're, there's just lots of stress. So my family has been able to pray for their family that it would be no stress, um, um, good health, and that it would just be a fun time of traveling. So that's one of the things that um, we're excited about. Um, the other thing is that uh, for question number one is um, what are you excited about what's taking place right now is that our group is learning to let the Holy Spirit lead but we're still lacking in spending time in the Word which is frustrating to me. Um, so I brought up to our group last week and um, hopefully over the next week and the following weeks we'll be able to make some changes. We're definitely becoming more of a family. Uh, a couple of weeks, my wife is pregnant. She's due in October, but this pregnancy has been really hard. And so, a couple of weeks ago, she had to go to the hospital every single day. The hospital here is the doctor's office, um, and so the other family was able to look after our kids almost every day. And we, then we'd be able to share some meals together during the week. And I think that really helped bond us uh, closer together. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I hope to do over the next few weeks is teach my boys how to hear God's voice so that they can participate more in our gatherings instead of just running off to play. Um, we sometimes do things with the kids, um, a little Bible story and prayer, but for the most part they're, they might watch a Christian video, um, but then they just play but I'd like to bring them into the group um, at, at least for a little bit, not probably not for a full hour or anything, but help them to participate more by hearing God's voice and sharing what God's saying to them. And then the last thing is um, I'm traveling next week, and so my dad is flying over from the States. He's on an airplane right now. Um, and he's going to be with us throughout all of September, and He's Southern Baptist, been in traditional church all of his life, and it's going to be interesting to see how he fits into our little simple church gathering. Um, he's, of course, we're, we all have more of a charismatic bent, and he's Southern Baptist, so it's going to be interesting to see how he, uh, he relates to us. And uh, But I know he's excited about being here, so um, um, but this, this pretty much where we're at right now is we're growing as a family. We're going to have, um, next month we have to change our meetings from Sundays to Sunday during the week and we'll have two other families joining us with their little kids. And so our group is growing and we're all learning and it, it's good. We're, we're excited.
That's great. You brought up a lot of great stuff, Stephen. Really appreciate the sharing. Uh, talk about letting the Holy Spirit lead. And, you know, that is a, that is a journey. Um, you know, I quoted from Felicity earlier saying that's maybe one of the reasons we gather is that we uh, all can uh, learn what it means to uh, let the Holy Spirit lead and we can learn together what it means to hear God. And you brought the, up the children in that context, which is a great point because children really can learn to hear the voice of God. Children really can participate in every element of, of church life. Uh, it doesn't mean, like you said, that they'll necessarily uh, you know, to take the time at younger ages to be part of everything, but we certainly uh, see um, children involved in church life at, at a high, at, at a very high level uh, when they come into it young and when that becomes just part of their culture and they see themselves as very much a part of, of church life. Uh, they can be very active in sharing from scripture and praying for one another. Um, and I think it's, it's really is one of the strengths. Now, having said that, I will say that um, when we've transitioned, uh, it's difficult to transition teenagers. It's just difficult. In other words, when we've trained up uh, children in a traditional setting and youth groups, it's difficult to then take them as teenagers for some of them to transition into a house church type participatory gathering. But we definitely find with the younger children, it's very, very natural and they can be very involved. It's very powerful. Um, so good stuff there. Um, and you also brought up the whole thing about learning to minister to one another. And I think that's such a, a, a powerful point as well, uh, that that's, that's what we can really learn to do uh, in house church settings is we can learn to uh, both minister to one another. What does that really look like? What does it really uh, mean to bear with one another, to pray for one another, to weep with one another, to rejoice with one another? Uh, if if I had more time and I don't want to take the time and maybe I shared it somewhere else on a tape, I'm not sure, but I've had some powerful experiences where good friends, because they've been part of my community for some time, uh, were able to weep with me in a way that is just incredibly powerful and cathartic. Um, and, and that kind of uh, uh, community life, when it transcends not only just hanging out together, but also really being able to minister to each other at very deep levels, very, very, very powerful. Um, and then you brought up the idea of actually sharing life together as well, which is also, I think, very much what it means to be a family, uh, that there's often very practical ways that we can be involved in each other's lives. So brought a lot of good stuff, and I uh, appreciate the sharing. Just different ways, you know, as we look at these different areas and kind of hear people express them, we, you know, hopefully sort of getting a broader picture of what church uh, life can be um, as we pursue uh, uh, this kind of uh, simple church gatherings. Um, so, Carol, we're going to look to you next, if you jump in here. Sure. Um, I think that the things that I've been excited about lately, and even over the last, say, 18 months to two years, our church has really progressed in shifting our format from a more traditional church format to more of a participatory format. Um, for example, this last sun, this past Sunday, we had a group of probably around 20 to 30 people who were gathered. Um, the scripture happened to be, you are the salt of the earth, that we had all been reading about this past week. And we had just a number of people share from 15-year-olds to people close to 60 years old. And I think seeing the progress of people feeling comfortable sharing, um, participating, not just in a discussion, but in prayer, um, particularly I think with the prayer time and open prayer time, people being very comfortable with silence, um, not feeling that all the space needs to be filled, but there's time to have silence and allow God to speak to us has been very encouraging for me. Um, I think seeing that gathering, that coming together, and one of the things we talked about this past Sunday as a group was being a fruit of the week. Um, and I think it kind of ties into this idea of convenience of the family of our time with God through the week, then coming together on Sunday and sharing with each other and enhancing in the season and the fellowship all the much more. Um, I think as far as what I'm really learning and seeing about to implement now, um, one of the things that's very exciting to me is my sons go away to school, in fact, they leave in a couple of days, and they've talked about they can't always come home on the weekends to worship with us, and so this gives them a format to come together and really 
bring people from their dorm with them, um, or even just the two of them be together and have a time of worship. And I'm excited about that for them, for them to be able to have a simple gathering. And the other thing is, as, a, as our community here at home, we're going to start studying spiritual gifts. And I think that really ties into this whole thing as well, is really helping people see how God can use them, not just in the fellowship, but in, in their lives, and how that all ties together. Absolutely great. Yeah, that's really some, uh, um, yeah, I, uh, I'm sorry, Mario just typed me a note. I don't always notice it, but that'd be fine, Mario. Um, seeing your gatherings become more participatory, and that is a process, and a number of people brought that up is, you know, how do you do it? It's a process as people do become more comfortable with, with uh, participating, uh, as people realize that the, there's really a value in that, uh, as as we learn to really listen to each other, as we learn to listen to the quieter people. I think often the quieter people have the most to share, and if we make room for them, um, it's amazing what can take place. Uh, I like the way you brought out how important silence is, and that, that came up in the forums, I think, uh, this week as well. You know, what do you do with the silence? Silence really is a great opportunity to just uh, wait it out and allow God to speak, and you know, when we're facilitating, we should welcome silence as an opportunity for uh, just giving time uh, for for God to speak and to nudge, you know, those that are, are going to share. Uh, gatherings can certainly happen at any time and are a great place for uh, deepening of, uh, you know, opportunity for deepening uh, people's lives anytime. So good stuff. I think in terms of, um, you know, participatory gatherings, um, it's it's it is good to to reflect on what does it really take to facilitate a good participatory gathering, and a lot of times that means what we're doing is asking questions rather than answering questions. And when we learn to facilitate by asking questions, it does two things. First of all, it makes room for everybody else to share, and second of all, it makes facilitating very very easy. Uh, when facilitating is nothing but asking questions, almost anybody can learn to do it. So for facilitating. Uh, uh, just a time with God, uh, you know, we can just ask what's God saying to us? What did God speak to us this week? When we're in the scripture, we can we can look at it and say, what, is, what does this tell you about God as we're opening the word of God together? There's a number of questions we can use just to get people interacting around the word of God. What does this tell you about God? What does this tell you about man? Um, what are the promises you, we see in this in these verses? What are the challenges we see in these verses? Uh, how will we walk them out? Uh, when we learn more that we learn to facilitate by asking rather than answering, uh, like I said, it uh, opens the door for everybody to, to participate. And like I said, very importantly, it provides a model where anybody can actually facilitate uh, any of the element uh, of the gathering when the facilitator is primarily just asking questions, because asking questions isn't so difficult. Um, and so sometimes it's very easy to get uh, new people, young people, children involved in even facilitating key parts of the gathering uh, because all they have to do is um, ask some questions that they've heard asked before and uh, it, it keeps things moving. So great sharing. Um, looks like uh, Mario would like to go next. Let's see where uh, you are on my little list. So we'll go with uh, Mario and let's just share Mario. All right. And uh, thanks for letting me cut. We have our, our meeting started an hour ago and <clears throat> my wife just walked in so we're waiting on me. Okay. Um, Okay, so some things I guess I'm excited about. We are, we're not a house church, but uh, we're, are, I guess we're leading a small group um, in a traditional church. I'm also um, overseeing all, all of the small groups in our church, which has been neat because I've, I've shared a lot of the stuff that I've learned this year with our pastor, and he's really open to um, implementing a lot of these things um, that we're talking about here. So... Uh, I guess our group um, in the past four months, one thing that's that's really been neat is that this is all new to them. It's, it's really new to me also, but as I share with them, it's just brand new. And what has been exciting for me is that they're they're willing to try these things out. You know, no one's been resistant and said, well, no, I'm going to leave the group because I'm not okay with that. Um, but some of the things we started doing, like before the class, was we started doing um, – one week a month, um, we would just leave the living room and we would go uh, minister to someone. One of the main things we've done is we picked a, uh, a mobile home community that's right next door to our church and um, just 
no agenda really other than to get to know them and um, start building some relationships, have free snow cones and, and hot dogs. And actually this Saturday we're talking about um, when we go out there about just having a movie for the kids and uh, getting to talk to the parents more one-on-one. -on -one. And so that's been neat that the group is willing to do that and, and just to get out like that. Um, I did share in a post it, last night or the night before what was neat is um, we're, there's a couple newer Christians, but there's several older Christians. Um, but one thing is our prayer time has always been very, um, very few people sharing. And so what was really cool last week is we just tried something a little bit new and stood up and held hands and, and went around. And actually everybody prayed, even a girl, we're not even sure as a believer, <clears throat> but she prayed about some of the stuff that you know we're talking about that that meeting and that was just really encouraging to see everyone sharing and as we talk about um, transitioning to a participatory meeting which is foreign to us and what we've always done um, that that was just exciting and so I think I shared a challenge that we're facing on that post also in getting people involved in other things besides the prayer um, some things to implement, I think, in our group and <clears throat> kind of a, I guess, a vision I have for all of our groups at our church is a lot of what Ricardo's talking about and looking at our family uh, first and foremost and um, really strengthening that that bond there as a family and then adding more people to that uh, to that group and you know whether or not you call it house church just to be emphasizing the family. Um, also, the other thing. Um, it was, it was neat sharing with Ricardo because I think God's done some similar things in our lives and um, something that's been talked about in the group is, is just being the church you know, full time. At, at work I'm a firefighter, uh, a paramedic, and so I got people in the back of my ambulance that are not having their best day ever and so they're receptive and I get to do ministry at work and um, I just get to, it, it's I guess maybe it's easier for me um, to see my life as full-time ministry because of my job, I guess, and um, the things I do outside of work. Uh, but I I'm, I'm want to implement that. I, I'd, like, um, I'd like, I guess, everyone to see that as uh, we're just Sunday, you know, just to get out of this, um, this consumer, this, the pew warmer type, type of thing where we just church is Sunday only, and just for people to see that as, um, as our job as believers. And so uh, that's that's what I'm looking at. I, I try to share a lot of that type of vision with our small group. And as I meet with small group leaders, I try to share a lot of that. And that we really need to emphasize that uh, in our meetings and um, that, hey, we're not just here as part two of church for this week. You know, this is um, church. Church is our life. And um, this is just one little part of it as we gather. Um, and I, I do need to get after this, so if you all have time to share challenges, I, I did share the one on my post last night. But the other thing is um, something I'm trying to trying to deal with and seek God is, is um, how to live as community. And it's funny, um, Sarah brought up Desi because I met Desi earlier this year, and just as he talked about what their groups look like and how community oriented we are, and they're just always together and hanging out and helping each other. I just long for that, and man, I, I told him I'm going to move to Denver just to just to be part of that because it's really uh, it's exciting to see that and to hear about it, and I I long for that um, in my life just to be involved in, in community and um, do it. Move here, move here. <laughs> yeah. So um, I guess that's that's a challenge is or our two cha two challenges for us is uh, how does my family how do we live. How do we be more involved in, in community things? And I guess one thing we did that started this week is it was a big step for us. We took our kids out of homeschool and threw them out into the through the gates of hell in a public school. That's how we've always seen it. <laughs> but um, that that was a big step. But we did that intentionally to connect with more families and just to put ourselves out there and, and meet uh, meet people that live right here in our on our street and, and all around. Yeah, it's great. Great. Thanks for jumping in here, Mario. Um, okay. I'm going to move us along. I'll catch your rest on Yep. Okay, thank you. Yep. I'm going to move us on because we are 
Uh, running short on time here, but great stuff brought out there. Uh, again, family first, be the church full time, not a consumer, living as, uh, together as community. Good, good stuff being shared. Uh, Braden, you want to jump in here as well? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. Um, my, my situation over here in Italy is, is I'm essentially, I guess, on staff at a, reasonably sized church, so a fairly traditional model church, and I also have a role with the movement of churches here, um, helping them to establish themselves in a Bible college and pastors training and so on. It's a fairly new movement um, that's broken away. It's a group of churches that have broken away from a very um, a traditional group of churches, I guess. Um, and at the same time, I'm, I'm going through this process myself, uh, partly because you know, I'm experiencing a new culture and a way of looking at church. Um, and I've been asked to um, look at some church planting options here in Italy, and, and so that's why I've been looking at all this type of thing. Um, but a lot of what I'm doing is still involved in a, in a traditional church model, which I'm enjoying, and it's a, it's a, it's a real challenge. Um, but um, what I have started doing is um, just meeting with a couple of a couple of guys to uh, study the Bible and pray together, and uh, and really I'm starting to see that as the real, I guess, foundation of church life. And we've had some discussion on the CO2s, and um, this is really based on a model called um, well triads, I guess, from an author by the name of Greg Ogden, and um, so the three of us are meeting together and just studying together. One of them is a, a, a refugee from Nigeria, and the other guy is a, is a fairly new Christian, um, both in their 30s, and um, the, the guy who's a, who's a fairly new Christian, he's Italian, um, and he was actually um, Greek Orthodox for a little while. Uh, which isn't very common in, in Italy, and um, spent three, he spent three years at the age of 18 in a monastery in, in Greece, um, studying with the, with the monks there, which is fascinating, but, um, but we've just had a really good time of, of really looking at basics and studying together, praying for each other, um, and, and, um, and really getting involved in each other's life. and. Um, We've been looking at the issue, the the the, the idea of hospitality, in particular, and, and the role that plays in in, in foundational Christian living. And um, and so, when they've been around and others been around, we've we've made sure we've been included meals and just spending time um, over a meal talking, which has been really good. Um, we are just in talks at the moment of of planting a. a a church um, and a more simple church model, and uh, just talking through that with um, a couple of people who, who we will start that with. And one of the biggest challenges I see there is um, in such a traditional church culture that we have here is helping them to deconstruct to realise that um, as we meet together in that simple church env environment, simply um, you know that. that and I like the Acts 2 pattern, I guess, as well, Te teaching, having fellowship, breaking in bread and prayer and being led by the Holy Spirit is, is enabling them to realize that that is church, that they don't also have to attend a, 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 a proper service, as I'm sure they would see it on, on a Sunday morning. Um, so just working through that and, and talking through with a few people at the moment, and we've developed some papers, to um, discussion papers, to talk about those sort of things. So, yeah, that's um, that's really where I'm at at the moment. Great, good stuff again. Um, yeah, I really hear the uh, kind of uh, the journey with even two or three others, and uh, it's interesting as as our as our paradigm begins to shift, then what we experience with two or three others, uh, we, it begins to take a little bit different meaning, and we begin to see, you know, the potential of what can happen, uh, even with two or three others, when we really get involved in each other's lives, and, and, and 
and have the expectation that uh, we are living the church life together. What does that mean, and uh, what does it mean to walk that out? Um, and uh, the emphasis on hospitality. And I certainly appreciate uh, the challenges of uh, working with people that are in that traditional culture and seeing them make the transition. And uh, it can happen. It can take time, but uh, it's good. Good, good, good stuff, Braden. Thanks for sharing it. And uh, Ian, we haven't forgot about you, so uh, the uh, last is not least, and you're welcome to jump in here. Okay, thank you. It's been a pleasure to listen to everybody. Um, if you've been reading my sort of uh, reflections, you'll know that uh, I'm a, a full-time uh, elder in the church here in the UK. And uh, one of a team of elders, in fact, although I'm, I'm the only one who's full-time and therefore paid to be an elder. Um, but it's quite interesting, actually, reading through some of this stuff and trying to apply it to our lives here. Uh, we're an independent traditional church, but from a, a brethren background. And traditionally that means the church has no full-time people because they very much believe that God provides the gifts um, in the church um, to fulfill all the ministry that's, that's necessary, really. And uh, very much as well participatory and spirit-led, although in probably in a non-charismatic way. Uh, generally speaking, over here. But in recent years, uh, the church has grown, and, and uh, we've had Christians join us from other traditions, and we've had new Christians uh, come into the church as well from, from no tradition. And it means that we've had to try and redefine ourselves uh, several times over the last few years. And we're at that stage now, again, really. And, um, it, I, I mean, just a simple thing is, is what, you know, what to call someone in my position really because those who are from the brethren background don't want to call me the pastor or the minister because that's not what they've uh, grown up with um, but full-time elders a bit of a mouthful as well really whereas those who've come from a background where there are uh, pastors and ministers are quite keen to call me pastor and minister really so that's a bit of an issue and, um, and not everybody wants to call me Ian funnily enough so I don't know what's going on there <laughs> anyway it's, it, the simple church thinking uh, I've been doing these last few weeks have been very helpful and actually very challenging as, as well. I've, I've just taken two days to read Pagan Christianity, which I've never seen before, and uh, and I've got the next book as well, Reimagining Church. I haven't started that yet, but I'm going to now, and, and uh, it's really challenging the socks off of me. And I just thought I'd tell you, tell you something that's happened in these last uh, couple of days as, uh, as I guess I'm trying to apply the teaching from uh, from simple church into the traditional church that I belong in, but from within, really. Uh, one of my fellow elders, who's got a real heart to see God at work uh, in the church and see people transformed and kingdom come, uh, is, is a guy who, who has to commute about an hour in his car to where he works at the moment. So he takes the time to listen to sermons. And uh, he was listening to a Martin Lloyd-Jones sermon from 1969. Uh, just about a week ago, uh, he, Martin Lloyd-Jones was speaking at a conference in, in Canada. And he was preaching from Exodus chapter 33, and the title was uh, The Highway to Revival. And uh, the climax to Moses' prayer in that chapter is, is really, show me your glory. And uh, this guy, who, who really senses that God wants to move in our church, and, but when, you know, we're not quite sure how or in what way, uh, had to move into the slow lane on the motorway here, the freeway, to clear the tears from his eyes because he felt so moved that, uh, you know, that God wanted to do something along the lines of, of showing us his, his glory. So when he got home, he shared it with the rest of us uh, elders. And we came together to pray last night. And uh, there's only three of us because one guy's on, on his holidays. But as we gathered together, uh, I shared some of what I'd been reading in these last few days. And so rather than sort of, you know, coming together with an agenda, we just listened, really, waited on the Lord to lead us. And we had the, the best time ever, really. Uh, it, there were various scriptures where the Lord reminded us that he was present with us, you know, two or three gathered together, that kind of thing. He reminded us of, of his glory in the Trinity. So, uh, you know, 
Jesus was present with us by his spirit and, and the Father as well. I mean, I can't put it into words now, but there's just this overwhelming sense of um, the Trinity and being present with us in, in Trinity. Uh, he also reminded us of our unworthiness and yet the fact that we were forgiven and the fact that, in fact, we, we will share a throne with him, which just blew us all away, really. Um, there was just a real sense that as leaders, as elders in this church, we were catching up with what God is going to do. You know, he's, as we've been, as I've been reading, as people have been saying tonight, uh, God's got a plan for us. And really it's about us listening uh, to discern, you know, what he's doing and catching up with him really. And I think last night at the meeting we heard some of his promptings. And so, so it certainly wasn't a boring meeting uh, mm. uh, even though there were some silences from time to time. So, so that was terrific, actually, and just sort of uh, underscored, uh, you know, some of this thinking that you've helped me to do in these last couple of weeks. And, and there was a real sense, I think, as well, this is the second thing which I'm quite excited about, just, just uh, briefly, um, is that, you know, having experienced what we did last night, really, one of the items on our agenda for future meetings is, is our home groups. Uh, which I think we recognize are become a bit stale perhaps and the leaders are a bit tired and uh, the whole prevenience thing now I'm quite excited about and um, hopefully uh, we can uh, or I can pass these books on and some of this um, reading over to our leaders and, and meet with them and we can talk about how they can lead their groups or at least how they can allow Christ to lead their groups in this sort of uh, you know uh, participatory, participatory. I don't know how you say it in America. It's, I think it's participatory over here, in this participatory way. Um, and you know, in that way, perhaps to say what the Lord's doing in the lives of the people in our church. Yeah. So it's quite exciting, but quite challenging too. And that's a great way to sum this up. It's quite challenging and quite exciting. Um, and I, I think I just want to echo that as we kind of wrap up here. I. I have been in so many, like like all of you, have been in so many different kinds of gatherings and services, and you know, charismatic and non-charismatic, and and exciting and dull, and uh, many different venues. Um, but uh, the potential I find when a uh, a small, simple community of believers are are listening to what God is saying, uh, there there have been some times, and again. It's not. It's not going to be that way all of the time. But my my goodness, some of the some of the uh, some of the most um, you know deep and glorious and meaningful and transformative times have certainly been the times when a when a small group of believers, whether it could be two, three, fifteen, twenty, uh, but we're really as a community are really listening and discerning what God's doing, and there's just a movement. It can go in many different directions, uh, but there's a response to what the Father's doing. Sometimes it's about ministering to one person. Sometimes it's about reflecting on who he is and his glory, like uh, Ian brought out. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the potential for, for really seeing the fullness, as we quoted Viola earlier, uh, the potential for really seeing Jesus uh, really display who he is by displaying himself through every single person, every gift is truly, truly an amazing thing. Um, and at the same time, challenging. In fact, my closing slide, I will put up uh, this one for you. Uh, because I'm not trying to oversell something, I'm just excited about the potential. Oops, let me get it back. The potential that is uh, in our gatherings when all of us together as a community uh, learn to really hear the voice of God. And when we create an environment where all of the disciples are, are seeking God together, the potential is truly amazing. Uh, but challenging because it can also be uh, messy. I mean, you're dealing with people, and so all kinds of things can happen. And it's not always going to be perfect. And yet pursuing uh, God in this kind of community really does open up uh, tremendous opportunities. And it allows um, the members of a community to fully, I believe, grow up. And uh, it's one of the things I think that happens with uh, when participatory gatherings, and in my heart, at least my conviction, is that participatory gatherings uh, are the norm. We can have many other kinds of gatherings. Uh, great. But something happens when the participatory gathering is the primary gathering. 
people get it that their part matters. And that's that's my heart to communicate to every believer, that their part matters, their gifts matter, their contribution matters, and them growing up and stepping into who they're meant to be, that matters. And when the whole body steps into that, it really does allow the body to grow up and be more fully who, who the body is meant to be. And so from my perspective, the participatory gathering, when it's the primary gathering, really puts that message out there, that the body of Christ is truly about every member, and that the body of Christ uh, functions most fully when every member fully participates. And yeah, it's going to be messy, and yeah, we're going to have to grow up into that, and yeah, we're going to have to learn how to listen to God together, and yeah, shy people are going to have to share a little bit more, and yeah, verbal people are going to have to share a little bit less, and yeah, all of that is, is, uh, provides challenges, yet the potential when the whole body steps into uh, being who uh, each member is meant to be, what, what a glorious thing and what a glorious potential that is. And uh, that's just my, my quick description of, of what my heart is and why the participatory environment, again, not the only environment, but why I see the importance of it being a primary expression uh, for the church today. The church in the West has been primarily modeled around uh, the gift of teaching as, as the, the core component, uh, kind of the, the, the Greek educational model. Um, and, of course, there's great benefits from teaching, but I think reclaiming the very heart of gatherings being every member contributing uh, can really revolutionize and allow the church to fully grow into the maturity that the church is meant to step into. So my final words there, guys, we've gone over. I'm going to close uh, in prayer here and uh, hang out for a few minutes if anybody uh, would like to uh, hang out. So, Father, I just thank you for the many different expressions of uh, as people are exploring different ways to gather, as we're all exploring what it means to gather as the body of Christ, as we're exploring what it means to gather in participatory ways, as we're exploring ways to gather in ways that build up one another. Uh, we're learning, we're growing, and uh, the idea that, uh, Father, when we gather together, you're at work, and we get to uncover what we're what you're doing. We get to follow you. Uh, we get to be involved with uh, you as you minister to one another, and we get to develop a community life with one another. We're excited to go forward in this journey, however you lead each of us. So I just uh, ask that you bless us in uh, this next uh, couple weeks of time together. Uh, be with our triads this week. I pray that all of the logistics around triads would come together and that we continue to go forward together. So we just bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for hanging in uh, a little bit late here, guys, and uh, had a great time with you. The forums are going great. Uh, good reports from the triads. It will be a triad week again this time, and uh, we'll keep moving on. Uh, again, I'll hang out for a few minutes if uh, anybody has to, uh, questions or anything that you need to discuss, but feel free to sign on out. Bless you guys. Thanks, Roger. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Bless you guys that are up early in the morning. Talk to you later.